I'd like to welcome you all to this jointly sponsored program between us, the Asian Art Museum, and Sachi, the Ooh. South Asian Culture. What does it stand for? <laughs> Society for Art for and, art and Culture. And culture. Heritage, heritage India. for India. Yes, the Society for Art and Cultural Heritage of India. of India. Just before this talk today, I was speaking with several of our longtime Sachi members and the supporters of the museum. And the topic of Sachi, it's my name, came up. So some of the founders of Sachi are here with us today. And I want to thank them for joining us uh, today. And today. Uh, my responsibility today is to introduce uh, one of our speakers. Um, she will be joining us shortly. Uh, Abby Chen is our Senior Associate Curator for Contemporary Art and Head of our Contemporary Art Department. She will be in dialogue this morning with a special guest who has come from far away. And it's my opportunity now to introduce to you another Sachi member who is going to introduce our visiting guest. Uh, the Sachi member I'll bring up is Marianne Milford, a former faculty member of Mills College and distinguished longtime member of Sachi. Oh, talk generally there. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. And it's so lovely to see live faces and familiar faces and to be actually able to acknowledge each other after all this time. And for many of us, this is the first time we have returned to the museum physically. Um, they have this wonderful series of lectures, the Society for Asian Art, every Friday, and it's been a magnificent series that just come to an end. And we've got a Sachi, and you know who Sachi is now, has a very close relationship with the Museum and with the Society for Asian Art. And so it gives me a, a lot of pleasure to be with all of you and to be especially up with Abby Chen, who is the curator of contemporary art here and um, celebrating um, the, at the new look at the museum. We're interested now in what's happening today. What's, what is going on in the art world? It's not what happened 5,000 years ago or even 100 years ago, but it's a vibrant artistic scene. And I'm so pleased that now we're actually working on that with um, Abby, who did some wonderful exhibitions actually at the Chinese Cultural Center in uh, San Francisco and brought some really important artists there. And now we have um, her exhibitions here and we're going to be um, hearing actually from her about um, with Rubina, about um, uh, the artists in India, and I just want to think of a call out for uh, Jayashree Chakravarti, who could not be with us today, but uh, more of that in a minute. So um, the other thing I wanted to sort of say is that this is a collaboration between Saatchi and the museum. Uh, Society for Asian Art. We've got all these little acronyms for um, different parts of the museum world, art world. And Sachi is actually celebrating 25 years. So this is really a very, very special time for us. And we have a very close <laughs> relationship with the museum. We bring, and we're totally volunteer, absolutely volunteer. We don't get paid for anything that we do. And so we have to beg, borrow, and everything else. Um, I like to see one of my former graduate students in the back who's helping with the tech stuff, you know. And uh, this is how it is in the Bay Area. But we have brought extraordinary people um, with the help and support of the museum and Stanford and UC Berkeley and Mills. Um, anyway, today I want to talk a little bit about Rubina. Rubina is no stranger to the Bay Area. And in fact, I've known Rubina for just over 20 years now. It's been quite a long time. Uh, she spent two years here at Berkeley and at Mills College um, on a Fulbright Fellowship when she was a member of the uh, Women's Leadership Institute at Mills. And during that time, um, she took courses in art history and all sorts of different courses at Mills 
including the seminar, senior seminar with um, Joanne Bernstein and the great Moira Ra and um, a few of me. <laughs> so we really got to know each other there. I got to know her, her family, um, her husband and her daughter, Neha, Ashish and Neha, which was just wonderful. They're living in Berkeley. So she knows the scene over here. Um, I was working at the time on a retrospective, or first retrospective um, exhibition of uh, Zarina, um, well, we call her Zarina, but Zarina Hashbi, her work. Um, she was a faculty member at NYU and also at UC Santa Cruz. And just at that time, uh, Rubina was with us too, and we worked, we collaborated on curatorial work, and you wrote the most beautiful essay in the catalog. I was just rereading it. It was called Mapping the Night, Veiled in Poetry and Geometry. I mean, it's really, really lovely. And so thank you. And so we've had um, quite a few years of working together too. So since leaving, leaving Mills um, and returning to India and to home, Rubina has been one of the most significant moving forces behind the uh, surging rise of interest in contemporary art in India. And she is one of India's leading art critics. She is the director and chief curator of the Karan Nada Museum of Contemporary Art in um, Delhi. And I think we've had that position actually for about 10 years now. And she's, during that time, she's curated numerous exhibitions, held symposia and conferences. And in 2016, she was named the best curator of the year by the influential newspaper, India Today. And then in 2019, even bigger, she was curator for the Indian Pavilion at the 58th Venice Biennale. I mean, th these are extraordinary achievements. Rubina has accomplished so much and has been such an important leading light in the South Asian contemporary art world that we're truly honored that she's made time to come all the way over here to San Francisco to share her insights with us. Um, and we hope you'll be able to stay awake because I know you just like two days off the flight from India to the she's a little bit jet lag, but we um, thank you so very much. Now, before um, Abby and Rubina come together um, for their conversation, I did want to uh, share with you a video from Jayashree, who couldn't be with us today. Um, but this um, is, I think, a live video Zoom. Oh, <laughs> I, I was going to say. I have so few you wave here, Sophia. Everyone, it's been an uh, honor for me uh, to be part of this exhibition, Memento, with uh, Lang Fan. I have been very happy to be amongst all of you. Uh, but at the moment, because of the situation, uh, I couldn't be there. Uh, the way my work been installed is looking fabulous. And I can, I'm seeing the work again after a long time. I started this work actually uh, with the map making idea and uh, at that point what I thought how it went how I worked I can't remember everything but I continued doing it uh, after this uh, particular work I did another very large uh, immersive work uh, in 2003, uh, it's a kind of uh, idea that uh, a continuous uh, imagery, making a continuous imagery, and uh, talking about uh, many things like uh, self esteem, or there are many uh, words that I have written. With my work, the way I'm doing, I am growing actually, and as an artist, uh, it's always a learning process. Whatever I'm learning in one work, when I'm doing the next work, that 
experience, I'm trying to revisit. I'm trying to make it more clear. And again, I'm learning. So it's, it's a continuous day, I'm learning only. This is very important for me. Thank you very much to everyone present here. I hope uh, soon I'll be able to visit the museum. Thanks a lot. Um, I wish you could be with us too, um, but she was um, in exhibitions that I had curated as well, and I know her quite well. So this is a dear person, dear friend. But now I really want to hear from Regina and from Ali, and so I'm going to say welcome to the joining in welcoming Regina. Very kind and generous introduction. And yes, we go by 15 years. Uh, wonderful of this to be here with India. The next time I met you, that drives me uh, to do a lot. And I'm here writing on my course, working on the same material that you would uh, say that yes, I'm doing that. They've been trying to put me in an episode I'm so charged and so uh, energetic here. Thank you all for uh, this opportunity to speak with you. And uh, at an occasion where I see this wonderful exhibition day in Kentucky, on the spot in Kentucky. And um, last, yesterday, I think we spent a lot of time there in different space, and I was just uh, so amazed how it has come together. But every time, um, curators know that you know uh, exhibitions take up different kinds of uh, aim in different contexts, and the way that they're presented in different spaces. And uh, so it's, it's very, very um, interesting to see how uh, Ram and uh, Jayashree are talking to each other in this space. And it's a very contemplative space because Vidhi is also from here. Um, Jayashree wrote is also from here. And uh, both are work, there's such a malleation, it's extremely important. You don't see it from one side. So you are actually going around the space and it's making you participate and partake in what they're presenting to you. But we come to that conversation a little later. I thought it would be interesting to first talk about. Can you hear me or do you want me to hold the mic? Uh, is that okay? I'm a teacher, so I don't shout at all. Uh, and I think I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm always uh, able to speak without the mic being there. So I just thought that it would be interesting to uh, speak a little more about Indian artists, uh, artists from India, but in the Extraordinary work that she's done, which is quite unassuming and simple, and yet extremely profound in her thinking and in her creative uh, uh, imagination. So I, I thought that I should really present Jimson, and uh, you can stop me whenever you want to that be um, um, for the time and for the conversation and questions uh, later. Um, Okay, or I can stand here like this. Yeah. Does that be okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jayshi Chakravarti, who lives in Calcutta, Calcutta, is um, has lived all her life there, but she was born in Tripura, which is a very lush green area in eastern India. And her father, being a doctor and an nat avid naturalist. She got to travel a lot into forests at a very young age, and she got really um, preoccupied and very obsessed by nature and by being in nature and looking at the idea of uh, how her father used to explain as a doctor, the idea of birth and decay, the idea of cycles in nature, the idea of understanding what is the regenerative potential that nature has and how important it is to our lives. So this is how she grows up. And then she goes to study art in Shantini Ketan, which is the school that Chagor, Ravindra Chagor set up, which was also about being in the environment and learning under tree, shapes of tree and being in nature and uh, learning through a uh, very informal way. You know, not just sitting in classroom and not just classroom instruction, but actually being in the environment and close to nature, 
learning and observing and getting absorbed into the natural surroundings. So this was something that is in her formative years shaped her uh, thinking about uh, life and about herself. And then she comes to Baroda, which is also the place where I studied. And uh, that's another exposure to an urban environment, which is very different. It was not that lush, that not that green, though it had trees and uh, a lot of trees, I would say. But it was a very in, a different kind of setup because then when she was in Baroda, uh, there was a lot of conversation around urban thinking in art. What would post-independent art mean? What would artists do to really think about, um, you know, being in a, a being in a free nation now, and think about what kind of art should India be creating? And she became uh, she was in conversation with other artists, but nevertheless. She really was never drawn to figuration. Mm -hmm. She was not interested in painting human figures, though she was training as a painter, but she was not interested in painting human figures. She was still drawn to thinking about very little insignificant things around, whether they be insects, whether they be anthills, whether they would be uh, you know, nests on trees, things like that. This whole big, larger ecosystem, so to say, of ecology and environment was something that she was drawn to. While she was growing up, and quickly I will, I think I should change images. I'm just showing this uh, image because this is Jayashree's work with, uh, uh, shown along with uh, Lan Sun Sang, and I think both are very interesting works. We'll come to that uh, a little later. Um, she was saying that she revisited this work because it was done in 2002, <laughs> so uh, 20 years ago. And um, this is how she starts. And um, drawing has been very close to her heart. She thought that everything could be articulated and understood through drawing. And whether it would be a charcoal stick or whether graphite, she was very interested in capturing the energy of the fleeting moment. So how do you see that fleeting moment? How do you capture it? And that's how she worked in her early years. And this may remind, at least it reminds me of Vincent van Gogh, you know, very strongly. Because, the, and he has been dear to many of these artists. I mean, they have loved and cried in front of his work whenever they visited Paris or other places. So the paddy field is full of energy, full of uh, strokes that are chasing each other, and a low hanging sky, as you see in uh, Van Gogh also, and really trying to comprehend the idea of space and what kind of emotional scaling of experience. A, a space can offer, a pictorial space can offer. So then comes a transition where she breaks into a different kind of working. And I want to stress here that in India, around that time in the 70s and 60s and mm -hmm. onwards, there was a lot of emphasis on easel painting and oil painting. And a lot of artists were doing works which were in oil. And here was Jay Shri, who was for some reason, though she loved uh, painting canvases, she was making some shift and getting very drawn to the fragility of paper, as well as the rawness and the textural quality of paper. So she started doing less of painting on canvases and started working on paper. But paper had a limitation in terms of size, okay? And at that time, at least, uh, you could never get bigger size papers. Imperial size is what you could get. But she started working on paper and also in some way trying to understand how she could maybe punch the paper, you know, punctuate it, maybe break it, maybe use some kind of cut and paste on it and many different kinds of things she started doing using pigment, acrylic, many other kinds of mediums. And it's kind of a mixed media work is what comes in. And I think she's trying to rupture and break the and disrupt the surface and try to create textures through which she started expressing herself. And then I'm, I'm jumping fast, but I mean, it took her long, but I'm just trying to say it's a prolonged working of experimenting in, in paper. She started, and this was one of her very large installation at Drawing Center in New York. And she started to gravitate towards making paper scrolls. And these are scrolls she makes from scratch because there is no way to have such a large paper scroll. So she started to work on building up bits and bits, bits and bits of paper 
and then sticking them together, uh, superimposing them, and then creating these brass crows, which is started suspending from the ceiling, and wanted to create a space in which you could move in and out. And what she did was also very interesting because she was now trying to get over this idea of a easel painting, which is only one-sided. She wanted to keep the experience continuous, and so you could actually go in and out and see both sides uh, being painted and both sides conveying something. So there is an experience in the way that you would go in and feel sheltered or get this kind of a very exclusive space to be in and also read very closely, playing on this idea of proximity and distance, that there are things that she writes which you have to go very close to look at and inspect and from far actually uh, try to understand and comprehend how this uh, space, a flowing space was created, which was her own personal space. This title comes a lot in her work, personal space. What is this personal space that she's looking for and why was she looking for personal space is the question. Uh, so I'm going to jump to straight away the sister work of um, Jay Shri done in 2003, which was shown recently at the Kiran Nadal Museum of Art where I work. And the first piece is right here, which Abby has shown in here, personal space, 2002. These are two works that she did, which are extensive in size. The idea of the scroll has grown so much that she was thinking of making a paper scroll quite ambitiously, 40 feet. This is 40 feet, what you see here in uh, Abby's uh, uh, exhibition. And what we showed at the Kiranada Museum is a 60 feet work. And this one is resting on the ground. The other one here is light, more ethereal, more airy. It is suspended uh, in, in the space that you see. This is also in height, but much uh, higher than what you see uh, in this show. But what was she doing by becoming so ambitious? Because whenever I've spoken with her, I've understood that this scroll making is a very obsessive kind of working because she doesn't use any one paper. It's a composite of many kinds of paper. There is the Chinese paper, there's a Nepalese paper, there is the tissue paper. There are different kinds of papers, transparent papers, thick papers. She brings them together, superimposes layer by layer. So it's a very extensive, labor extensive process. And then more so, it's not just about the paper, what she's doing in terms of the process becomes even more interesting because she is trying to use any and everything. There is no premeditated plan of how she will work. And I like that unpredictability of the, of the technique because she just allowed herself to play with this. And when I first spoke with her about this, she said, I wanted to create my own wall, okay? So it's like you want to make your own shape-shifting wall. But think for a moment, how is paper going to stand on its own? It cannot stand on its own. So she realized very soon that the fragility of paper is what she's drawn to. That paper is vulnerable, but there, is, there should be a way to make it resilient. How do I make paper resilient? And so she started working on how to, uh, you know, layer it, how to glue it, how to superimpose it. And believe me, the work that you see here, the paper has, is, it has almost a leather quality. It can stand on its own. If I tell her that I want to fold it like this, she, she will actually show you how you can fold this paper and create this kind of an interior space. So she worked on the idea of paper and believe me, the best experiences that I've had with uh, Jayashree is to go to a studio. It's a crazy person's studio. I mean, there's no space to walk. So you have to actually walk on the work. So I was very, I was petrified to do that. I said, Jayashi, you are walking, but I'm not going to walk on your work. And she said, no, you have to walk on this. And I said, my God, this is, I've never done this. You know, I've never, never done this. And she said, no, you will walk. And I was surprised I was walking on the work because it was, it was a scroll which she was opening up and I'm supposed to go from here to there and there's no space around so I have to walk on it and go. And then she is like a superman. She says, nobody handles my work. I have to lift my scroll and I will have to show you how uh, you will see it. And then after I got, I had to take a break 
I saw her doing a yoga on her work. <laughs> so uh, she was doing yoga asana, and I was sitting there and watching her, and all she does, she's totally her entire body movement is in the work, is what I'm trying to say. She's completely in the work, immersed in the work, and that's how she works. And it became a very, uh, so every time I visit a studio, I come back with great ideas thinking about the work that it is, it's the process and the technique and it's the material that come together to really have this experience, you know, transporting you to some kind of a very emotional sense of space, as well as what she's trying to convey in terms of uh, architecture or imagery or symbolism that go within, uh, you know, go, go within making such works. Moreover, but I have this kind of very crazy uh, conversations also where I say, you have done so much on these walls and you're calling it a space of reflection. And she would counter and tell me, it is from going from the outside into the inside. And when you're inside alone, you will feel that space of reflection. So it's, it's this, uh, I'm stressing on circumambulation because that's a very interesting part of understanding this uh, personal wall that she creates with her memories being imprinted and impressed onto uh, this work and how she understands material. But then this relationship with paper and prolonged working has led her into such insights about the medium and the process and material that she keeps re uh, self-inventing that I find fascinating because when I was writing about this work, when it was being shown at the museum, I realized that when she just, she says one line that I was thinking of creating my own wall, which would shape shift wherever possible, whenever possible, I realized that she was using colors, which are exactly the colors that one could see, uh, you know, used for building or in caves. So it's an earth color, it's a, it's a, a, what is it called, lime color, it's a concrete color, it's a brick color, those or, or soup inside caves, which have been, you know, where animals have been living, those kinds of uh, colors you see in the way that she was creating these crevices and uh, marks and mark making that she was doing on these walls. And a lot of it is through staining, staining. She stained the work a lot. She's constantly staining the paper and understanding that that creates surfaces or creates uh, layers through which she can actually excavate a lot of uh, imagery on it. It's almost like graffiti at times, graffiti on cave walls, imprints of, uh, you know, primordial <laughs> times. People have left their handprints outside cave, inside caves to talk about their presences there, the traces that are left behind by humankind, and all those many, many layers of uh, uh, complex symbolism. So you can see some. And she was mentioning, like you can see a vortex or a whirlpool or cities being destroyed by flood or disappearance of uh, cities, cities getting buried under other cities, things like that. And also correlating sometimes, at least at that time, she was using a lot of text. So you do see words scattered. What happened? Sorry. Uh, so you see words scattered, abstract symbols, love, this, you know, art, creativity. So I'm right here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So you see these. Oh, 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 oh. Um, okay. So you see these kinds of images that come. Every, and, and what I like very much about the artist is there is a sense of tentativeness in the way that she's mark making, you know, but that tentativeness has so much concreteness in the way that she, these, uh, finally these uh, in, uh, imagery, the imagery emerges, you know, how she makes it emerge from within the layers. Now, so I'm just going to uh, breeze through these images. These are all on those, uh, on the 60 feet uh, um, wall that you just saw. This is Kiranada, who's the founder and the chairperson of the Kiranada Museum of Art. She's also an avid collector of art and she's put this museum together. And uh, we are watching, we are inside this uh, the 60 feet installation. 
So when she started, so let me briefly tell you, I'm just going to go back a bit to tell you about, I think she was most disturbed by the congestive urbanism that she experienced in Calcutta. You know, the idea that one can, you know, when a rapid urbanization happens, and which is what happened in many cities in India, it's also mindless urbanization, if I can put it that way. And what that does to the ecology of that place, what does it do to other species living, uh, uh, living in that space and surrounding? Because she grew in Salt Lake, Marshland, in Calcutta, she saw a lot of aquatic life. She was very close to the life which was there in terms of animals, birds, fish, uh, a lot of water birds and water animals. And her father bought a property there, a land there to build a house. And over the years, you would know this is a very interesting story, a very troubling story. The Salt Lake area turned into a Salt Lake City, which is what it's called now, a Salt Lake City. So with this kind of congested urbanism, the aquatic life started being destroyed. It almost disappeared. And she was lamenting literally every time that she was looking around that the cityscape had changed. The city skyline had changed. So many species just were destroyed and everything was disappearing. And this loss was really too much to take. You know, this kind of an urbanization can really create an imbalance, an ecological imbalance. And what it does to the environment is you're deprived completely of green spaces, green areas. You don't connect with any other species or creative life around you. And that was something that started entering her imagery. And you see how it is, it's like a riot. It's every work is like painting with a frenzy of some kind, where you know she's just playing with so much, everything is going over everything, and there's so many things getting disappeared, eliminated, erased. And it became a technique of working, which I so like in Jayshri. She's painting and erasing simultaneously. Here is a stroke and here is a erasure. Here is a stroke, here's a erasure. It goes on and on and on and on. And what remains is what has remained, actually. So this kind of a disappearance of things was something which was very powerful. In fact, you also see a lot of city structures, old monuments, old heritage buildings getting destroyed because of the way the new buildings and the new developments were taking place in Calcutta. And Calcutta has such a rich heritage. You know, it goes back even before colonial times, I would say. And so this was a, a thing that she was addressing uh, very, very um, blatantly in her work in terms of uh, not as giving a method so much as speaking through the process in which she was, uh, you know, so uh, embedding these, uh, these nuances. And the spillovers, the ruptures, the disruptions, that became a language for her. So there are figures at times, but they are completely, they are completely lost in it. They're almost like they are these mute witnesses. Okay. So you do see them come here and there, but like mute witnesses who have, who don't who cannot do anything. As if they're helplessly watching what is just disintegrating in front of them. Okay. And that's how the um, how she used to work for quite some time. Uh, so you can see it's like almost weaving a tapestry out of it because that is what she does at time, you know, she's mapping. And uh, what I find very uh, overpowering is also that there is a very um, dominant use of white, white paint, white pigment. So even when the dust layers, earth layers and blacks are done, the white comes over as if it's eliminating parts and leaving certain things there for you to see. Sometimes going back to history books, to natural history books, to literature that she was reading. She was an avid reader. Her father was an avid reader. They loved books. And all that comes here in uh, different ways and different forms. And this is a work that I particularly like. And I showed it in our show that I had curated in Nice uh, of Jayshree's. Uh, so this is a very large work, in fact. And then you see a fish. But it's not one fish, as you if you see it closely, you'll see that it's a pair of fish, okay? And they both are dying because the salt lake waters are dried up, okay? So they are wounded and they are dying together. And the city, of course, as you can see, is in this kind of a riot. The city is also in turmoil of some kind. And that's what it plays out here. Um, and see how dark she can go with her memories and her uh, sense of uh, 
being, you know, it's it's also this idea of how, how we are constantly pushing the earth to a precarious edge because it's not the nature is independent of force anymore. It is impacted by human action and it is also impacted by human control. So what will happen in times to come if we are really going to overpower everything uh, that is around us? And see what then happens when the earth is going through hell. Uh, this is what is going to happen. Animals as monsters are going to come out of the earth because earth is heated, global warming or whatever you call it. And there are going to be such kinds of disasters and catastrophes which will happen as we go along. And we will be the people who will be responsible for destroying the earth, destroying our own um, gift. Uh, I'm going to, I call that exhibition and means life will never be the same. Okay, it has this kind of a little um, lament that she, that the, that the artist would express then. And uh, it was very interesting. It's also an Asiatic museum and it has works which are all antiquarian. So there were a lot of uh, Buddha sculptures which could not be moved. So we had to put this exhibition around those ancient uh, and medieval objects which could not move. But it really, it spoke to us, each other. It became very interesting to think about creation in a very different way when you have contemporary works and you have also uh, antiquarian uh, objects. But, uh, and for me, that was, that also carried a meaning of uh, non-violence to Buddha and peace, and also caring for all, all living beings, and then uh, the vandalism that Jay Shukra showed. So here it is a salt lake, as you can see, but look at her, um, look at her uh, technique and medium, cotton fabric, Nepali paper, tissue paper, jute, grass, dry leaves, leaves, tea skin, clay, glue, glass, beads, you can go on. So this is how the work emerges from, uh, you know, with so many things getting into it and then lost lake under the city, as you can see how she's trying to talk about it and express what happened and how congested life is and how the salt lake you can see in the center, the shrunken salt lake right there. And then what happened to her is very interesting. She got interested in using nature, not just as a subject and theme of her work, but as substance of her art. So she started collecting nature fragments and nature remnants and nature material which would be from beads to seeds, to dry leaves, to fallen dry fruits, uh, to anything that she found. That's why the studio is very interesting. Okay, you can't go on a staircase without seeing all this hanging there. So all of this she started collecting and then she wanted to actually use this material in her work. So for her to make a paper, uh, a paper scroll became another kind of exercise. Let's see how. So I'm just going to show you one or two examples where the Buddha is uh, standing, and this is a this is a torn river map that uh, that she had presented. This is called the alien sphere. Again, a space of reflection or space of shelter. She works a lot on the idea of shelter. If Earth cannot be shelter to human beings and to all other beings, which what will that place be? So this is a alien sphere. She calls it. So you go in and there is a dark space inside and you see all kinds of species looking at you, you know, from the smallest insect onwards. And then cocoon, she was drawn to the idea of cocoon because cocoon, she was watching steel pipes in, uh, you know, cities, you know, open, Calcutta is always under construction. So you have the steel pipe all over and you find that all other insects, they gravitate when they feel there is an alarm or a danger to them. And they all go and hide into these pipes. And this is exactly what uh, these little insects do. And so when they go in and hide, they, they are almost like they're in a cocoon space. And that's what. So she was inspired by cocoons, by nests, and things like that. She started working on this idea of the cocoon, in which she tries to inside show many of these insects and butterflies and uh, uh, many of those beetles and uh, things like that or the insect world that is taken care of and they are trying to find a shelter for themselves. As you can see, some are painted, some are screen printed, some are drawn, some are photocopied, and uh, but again layered. So this is how the cocoon opened up as a space inside out. 
and I had shown in Mumbai in a natural history museum where, where there were other insects and birds around in a very different configuration, of course, and that's possible to do with Ashwin work. This is at the museum. So uh, many iterations, I would say, uh, different configurations that one could work with. And then she, uh, again, um, Reena is sitting right here, Reena Lark, who is also the gallerist for Jeshi Chakravarti. And uh, Paris was a great experience. We were at Museum Guinée, and uh, Museum Guinée gave us uh, a space to actually show Jeshi's work in a culture blanche project. And I curated this under the canopy of love, Earth as Heaven, in 2017. So this is the Guinée Museum. And uh, it was a very interesting discussion. I'll come to that in a bit. So this is the earliest drawing that she shared with the director there, with Sophie uh, Macario, who is, the, who, is, who is the director. And she drew this. And when we were in that rotunda, which is a beautiful rotunda in the Ime building, uh, Sophie was telling us that every artist who has shown here has used the windows. There are multiple windows there to actually connect with the city outside. Okay, so you open, the windows open, you see the entire city, you can see the 360 degrees. And Jayesha decided to shut all the windows. <laughs> okay, so this was the drawing she made when we were talking. I said, what are you planning in this room? And she said, you know what? First thing, I want to create another space in the museum. And this space will be an outside in nature space brought into the inside. So we discussed with Sophie and we decided that the windows would be shut. And to do that, she created 18 or 19 scrolls with a insect-like form in the center. So you're seeing this insect-like form. And what, so this is how the work began. We started making the ribcage of the insect and you know, people were working. We were, it was a great experience uh, doing this project. And so the armature is being prepared and if the height of the rotunda is like 70 feet or something, it's like really huge. So what to do? Because this insect has to hang from there, okay? And uh, so she is up there with the technician who's uh, gone to help her to actually be able to suspend this. And here she's working on how the scrolls rest on the armature. And the work is on. This is work in process. And Jayashree is quite... Uh, very much in hands-on. She's right there working and putting her work. It's also something that I'm stressed on. All these stories are done by her without a single assistant. The assistant is only to wash the buckets, <laughs> the water, <laughs> and clean that. Nobody can touch the story. She does the work and it's it's mind blowing. It's it's phenomenal. It's back breaking. You can I, I, I can only tell you it's back breaking to be able to do. You have to be mad to be able to do this work. <laughs> and you are seeing how she's now putting these scrolls on the armature, and inside outside they are treated. And then this is the nature created in that rotunda like this. They are all backlit transparent scrolls. So from opaque scrolls. She graduated to understanding how to make transparent stones. And now in the transparent scrolls, she is sandwiching material, nature material, the roots, the stems, the leaves. So when you see it lit from the back, nature comes alive. Okay, you can actually see that she's trying to put a root and a stem together and make bring it to life, literally. It could be cycles of seasons, it could be, and these are all leaves collected and stems and roots collected by her, which she had carried. So, and that's then finally the earth as heaven. When you are outside, you see light. When you go in, you have to put on your mobile lights. And then you start seeing in that dark cave, beautiful insects, you know, from those glowworms to, <laughs> all of them looking at you and so beautiful the work is it's really something very interesting so yeah so this was and um, there was a performance on the opening day which was quite something I mean, what I'm stressed is you can see that it is suspended it's not sitting on the floor so yeah three minutes okay oh my god <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, so the idea was that <laughs> when you see, when you enter the insect, you are walking inside, your feet are the insect's legs. So when you're in, you're actually walking and they get a sense that the, the insect is walking. <laughs> okay, so I'm quickly show you the material that she used, beehive leaves. Okay, so I'm going to not talk much about this because I'm just going to show, this will be another chapter someday. Uh, cluttering lines and uh, yeah, but uh, before I end, I just want to stress on one thing, and that is, she actually took care of her, uh, both her ailing parents, and her parents were uh, suffering from cancer and a very long illness, prolonged illness. So for many years, she had to heal and uh, look after their wounds, dress them, uh, dress their wounds. So she started bringing very big doors. Uh, gauze material into the house. And she was so interested in using gauze in these scrolls. And the last bit of scroll that I showed are all carrying weeds, seeds, stems of medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. They carry, they are all used in Ayurveda to treat cancer, to treat uh, uh, disease, fatal diseases, to treat wounds, to heal them. And so she got into another kind of uh, you know, engagement, which is looking at nature also to think about healing and trying to collect these uh, plants and uh, these uh, uh, medicinal uh, seeds and things like flax seeds that we bring it a lot, many other seeds that we use. And she used to tell me, and she's very quiet about these things, but one day she got very emotional about it because we had our parents ailing, so some kind of a conversation began. And she told me that she got so interested in this and what nature can do. So there is somewhere this whole idea that nature is being destroyed. And so we are destroying our possibilities and capacities of healing ourselves and healing the earth. Okay. But and this renewal of hope happens when somebody tells you in Ayurveda there is a treatment for this. So in Ayurveda, there's a treatment for this. So that's how she got, got, got very really interested in exploring this. On the other hand, on one hand, there is hope of regenerative potential of nature. But on the other hand, other hand, the question is, can nature end this disease of nature? Thank you. I was very reluctant just now to uh, give you that three minutes here because I can just listen to it forever. <laughs> Another round of applause for you. <laughs> Hoping to get Rubina and Jashley to come here mm -hmm. since day one, actually. And I'm so glad none of us give up the idea. Mm -hmm. So finally, that she's here. And there's something really poetic about this process with Jashley's work. And now I can actually see it more clearly that how, like why you were so excited yesterday when you saw both of the work just close together, because there is this idea of disappearing, reemerge, mm -hmm. adding, deducting. And um, also when you talk about, you know, how she will use the charcoal, she will add one, she will deduct one. And it's very much actually like the Lumpang's process as well, because he started as a painter. So that's why you see this painting quality. I guess that's why that you feel so connected to it. So maybe you can share with our audience with the memento that's still up there, that why that you felt very connected to both pieces and maybe just your first impression about it and um, and how you see this narrative being built um, with this with this exhibition of that tour. Yeah, first I want to congratulate that the museum has these wonderful pieces, you know, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is uh, so good because um, when I walked in yesterday, I felt that I did not know the uh, the uh, lawns work very well, mm -hmm. but I did educate myself because, and when I was reading about him, I was so drawn to his practice because he's some he's like actually very extremely profound and quiet in the way he does things and both of them have this shape-shifting kind of idea so there is a sense of uh, ephemeral 
uh, you know, it's a ephemeral uh, way of doing things where you see shadows come and go, appearance and disappearance is constantly a matter of engagement. There is the city, but it disappears. There is something else that comes up and disappears. And so this whole idea of disappearance mm -hmm. is uh, quite predominant in their works. And what I like about their work is that um, the audience has to partake in it. Mm -hmm. It is not something like, uh, it, both of them do not have any one static vantage point in their work, which sure. means you cannot Very stand true. in one place and see and experience it. <laughs> You need to go around. You need to see it from multiple focal points, you know, as they build their narrative. And you have to be very agile and alert because things come and go, and you may just miss something. And especially in Jayshi, what I feel is that the material has been concretized in a very different way, and yet there's so much movement and energy and shape shifting of the wall and going in and out happening. In, in Nam, I'm very, very drawn to the fact that he has put objects outside the video, mm -hmm. and those are paper screens again. So they share this affinity in terms of, you know, what paper can do and how you can use it. And sometimes the opacity of paper, sometimes the porosity of paper, sometimes how much it can, you know, just uh, the illusions that can uh, happen with uh, the way that paper is used. and. There are these objects there, and I'm, I was telling that yesterday. I'm like touched by the idea of a little sparrow. Nowadays, we don't even get to see them, but the sparrow in Nanam's work is perched on a little branch. And then he has put a little sparrow as an object outside that space. And just the coming together juxtaposition is so powerful mm -hmm. and so poetic in the way that he does it. And these are, these are artists who really think so much about the work beyond the frame. The frame is not the important factor. Even in uh, Jayashri, I think these are unframed kind of experiences. You are just going around the wall and coming to another corner. Mm -hmm. And in Lam, Lam also, you're seeing something, you're going there, you're going behind, you're coming in. You just, it's not something that is going to fix you or give you a very fixed image of anything because the truth is, in art, in life, everything is unstable. But that instability of image is also in the work, which is such an interesting way of bringing it into a work, which most times we say art is always about a fixed image or a fixed reality, which is not. Reality is changing every moment, and the flux of experience and the fleetingness of life, everything is there for us to experience. And especially you talked about that both work actually require audience participation yes. in order to appreciate it. And actually both Jaishri's work and Lam's work, they're all in today's world, they're very low tech. Jaishri did not use any technology. Well, if we're talking about making leaves and layers paper technique involved, but there's no technology involved. No. But still the immersive impact and that experience of your whole body being mm -hmm. encounter with both of the work is very powerful. Thank you for saying that. It's so beautiful because it's nice. I mean, Ara, I mean, Jayashi's contemporaries are so drawn to industrial material, to industrial technology, to making huge like, uh, installations, noisy installations, using technology and not diverse to technology at all. Mm -hmm. But I feel that she really takes us, I mean, her, her message is so clear that you need to have nature touch you and you need to be close to it if you want to feel, you know, it's so important to feel uh, one with it. And what is happening in the world is we are losing the sense of oneness, which is that there has to be space for everything to coexist. And she constantly talked to me in many different ways. Uh, she articulates it very differently, but what I understand is that her father from childhood, she was learning about the idea of cohabitation and coexistence, which is so important in life. Mm -hmm. You know, so once you isolate from that, then you are just uh, becoming something else. You're just uh, the, the, the fabric around you is being just torn apart. I'm so glad to hear you saying that in terms of the world is losing its kind of this oneness. 
and globally, and we're all facing into a new era, particularly due to the pandemic, due to this isolation, um, and due to actual isolationism, um, and that we're further, further divided. So as curators, um, I would love to hear from you on how we continue this kind of cross-pollination, if it's even possible these days um, to conduct this kind of dialogue that we can resist such isolation and division. So how do we act? Because as curator, uh, in some way, we also function as artists as well. We need to create, uh, we need to care for stuff. And what kind of action is that in today's environment, particularly that we work in institutions? Yes, I think uh, this is very relevant. Yes. And I just want to add here and talk a little bit about the museum I'm working with for more than 12 years now. It is um, a pioneering institution in itself because uh, in India, there is still not much emphasis on uh, having museums which are dedicated to contemporary art. Okay, I think the antiquarian interest has been much more for many years now. But uh, Kiran Naga, who set up this museum, was more interested in looking at uh, the journeys after India gained independence, what has happened in post-independence decades, and what is modern in Indian art, and, and look at contemporary art. And one of the agendas, or one of the mandates of the museum is to really uh, emphasize collaboration, cross-cultural dialogues, transnational curating, hear different voices, so important. Thank you. You called me for that, maybe. You know, that's very <laughs> I, I think it is so important to do this because unless we learn this uh, kind of a sharing, because sometimes uh, one's views can become quite pedantic and limited because you're just thinking about your own space of functioning. But when you step out, it's a very different world. I can just go back to my experience with Mariana. I thank her profusely when I came to Mills. I understood India better. I, let me put it that way. Mm. I have never spent so much time outside India. But when I was in Mills, I was learning so much. And maybe a lot of it I didn't digest well or didn't really, it didn't sink in then. But when I went back, my eyes opened very differently to what I was seeing. And this is so important to do. This kind of an exposure, experience, stepping out of your comfort zone, going into an un unfamiliar space and learning to to have a dialogue or learning to work together. I think it's so important. And I think this is what the museum is doing. In fact, KNM has really uh, made this almost like this, it's our need of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were to do, we do work in London, we can do work in Paris, we can do work in a very small village in India, we go to uh, Kerala, in Kerala, a smaller case like Kochi. So I think those experiences and those kinds of, uh, you know, uh, cross connections and collaborations are very important. And I think that is what one should really uh, work for. Because dealing with a changing world, actually the artists are always ahead of us. You, and, and with Memento, um, it was very intentional mm -hmm. that we, um, we chose these two artists mm -hmm. because they're in very different environments. Jai Shui in Calcutta, London Han in Hong Kong. Yeah. They're both dealing with a changing city, whether it's environmentally changing or it's politically changing. And for us working in institutions, we're dealing with a changing institution climate, yes. particularly in the United States, as well as our cultural landscape, the nation, the globe are also changing. So in terms of institution, how do you, um, uh, let me think about how to say this question. How do we together kind of, again, act upon, for example, featuring these artists who are not necessarily widely known. They're not the so-called contemporary superstars, but they're doing really pioneering and important work. And how do we as an institution support these pioneering work while waiting for the public to catch up, and then at the same time, dealing with this challenge on audience engagement and audience awareness and knowledge production? It's a very good question. And I think most times that we just get uh, trapped into the idea of the usual suspects, mm -hmm. okay? But I think I was talking to Dikti this afternoon about this, that uh, 
you know, when we were trying to do an Asli Mahmoudi show, she mm -hmm. remained an admired artist of India, but always underrepresented. Mm -hmm. And she was never, never shown in any great shows that have to do with India or abroad. And she was an amazing artist. She was also my teacher. So I had a very different kind of equation with her in Bermuda. And she died without being, uh, no, not without, we just so without those her cases, work. Yes, and these cases, we know this, that we mm -hmm. celebrate every day the artists. Mm -hmm. And that has to change, you know, we have to really change that. And I felt that working, uh, when I was trying to do the show, there was so much apprehension. Nobody knows her. She does very severe minimalist work. It's just lines, only lines. How will audience come to her show? How will they react to it? What will they get of it? What will they understand of it? And believe me, Abby, and I'm not exaggerating, her exhibition made God knows I mean, how many people must have cried in that space. Mm -hmm. And I, I, for me as a curator, was very difficult because I was trying to present the work of an artist who was no more there. And so how do I create her presence mm -hmm. in that exhibition is what I was trying to do. There was not even a recording of her voice, so there was nothing that I had. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to, so I recreated a studio because I thought that that was a space of restoration. Mm -hmm. She was ailing and she never let us know that she had this uh, kind of a severe Parkinson's. And I, as a student, 17 year old, was watching her in a studio space. For me, that was such a, I mean, it, that imprint never left my mind. And I thought that I need to create that mm -hmm. for people. So that when they enter the exhibition space, they will prepare for this kind of a very beautiful inward side journey. And the book that Dipti was showing yesterday, the iteration of this exhibition that happened in Spain at the Reno Sofia was a line from her own personal diary, Waiting the Part of the Living. You know, so this, uh, and it was very emotional for me at one level, and very, I have to be very objective about what it's doing, is another thing. But yes, I think that underrepresented artists really need to be looked at because sometimes uh, they work. They work so quiet and they don't care whether they don't want the glare of the mainstream, they're away from mainstream, but they leave behind something which we only are able to, you know, uh, deconstruct and take hold and take up later on. Yeah. And the museum, as such, has worked on several of such artists that has been an interest area for, for us. And uh, I totally agree with you that we need to uh, expand this discourse. Mm -hmm. We need to make it more inclusive. We need to also look at artists who are in different regions and different spaces, not just the mainstream and the metropolis. Mm -hmm. It's very important, I think. And you mentioned that really key words deconstruct that narrative, or even the narrative that doesn't exist that yeah. needs to be deconstructed. And I'll add one more. De um, to it is mm. decolonize that process. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. particularly for many of the Asian American artists, that I have to give a very important plug that we're about to open Carlos Villa. This is his first major institutional retrospective. And then in September, we're going to open Bernie Spain. These two were on my wish list the moment I got into yeah. the museum. And we recently also, uh, well, we continue to acquire work. Living artists, I mean, these two, Bernice Bing and Carlos Villa, unfortunately all passed away. But we acquired Keisaki Machi, who is over 90 years old. Recently, Yankee Peck, 77 years old, all first time in the museum collection. So we have a lot, a lot of work to do, but I'm just so, so honored to work with a colleague like you. I wish you were here longer. <laughs> and, um, I, and I also want to really appreciate today's audience. So I know we've been talking. Um, any questions from the audience, feel free to raise your hand. I feel we're in a very intimate setting um, and it's very warm. Um, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> Jennifer is there. Um, so again, this is the idea that we, we hope that we feature artists that is not from one single region, that we capture a different kind of audience from different regions and culture. And this is a place for us to look at the different kind of aesthetic manifestation and then come together to think about it at a humanistic level. 
Uh, so any questions from the audience? Yeah, I, was, I was just yeah. going to say, so I just read that uh, you are going to be expanding your complex and that you are going into a new space. And, yes. uh, uh, and if you can tell us a little more about yes. so you've been here for about 12 years, right? In this socket area. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And um, so Kiran uh, says now that after it was a very little dream, a small dream that has grown big because she was looking for land for the last 10 years. Uh, and Delhi has no land. Okay, so I, if one can say that about San Francisco also. Maybe I'm just saying, talking about Delhi. Delhi is you <laughs> has no land. And then she, when she finally found the land, um, she decided that yes, now I want to give something to the city and to India and make a a, a, a big. Let's put it that way. Earlier, a manageable museum, and now it's really a little scary. Also, a big museum, which is now uh, on 8.5 acres, and uh, this is on the way to the international airport in Delhi, and uh, a very prime place in that sense. And uh, we are hopeful that the NCR region, which is Gurgaon, Noida, and Delhi, all three actually will be benefiting from uh, this museum. But what is really pioneering in, about this, um, the uh, idea is that she decided that there will be a museum with the cultural center. And this is uh, necessary to do in India because except for the um, museum, uh, the National Gallery of Modern Art, we have nothing in the name for contemporary music, contemporary dance. So how do we integrate these different art forms? So let's have the museum building, but we also have an adjacent, a large, cultural center functioning where you could have exposure to jazz, to Indian classical, to different kinds of music programs, dance programs, poetry readings, uh, sound programs, whatever. So this has become a now a more ambitious project than it was before. And uh, it is being designed by the renowned uh, internationally renowned art architect, Sir David Ajay. Who, did, who designed the Smithsonian uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, right in Africa. Now. So he um, he seems to have taken a great liking to Kiran because she's so enterprising. And he, so they have had these conversations and we have weekly conversations going on. The work has begun, but it's going to take four years. And she's trying to tell him, tell him it's in three and a half years. She said, I have to, I have to walk the building. I have to be in the building before I go up. <laughs> okay, so please don't delay it more. <laughs> so there is this kind of a pressure, but um, you know how things are. Things take their own time, and um, but it's the work has begun, and we are all looking forward because it's going to be a massive space with many permanent galleries. You know, it's very interesting for the twelve years that I've been with the Kiran Art Museum of Art since its inception. We never have been able to show just the permanent collection which is what she had dreamt earlier, that she has been collect collecting art for so long and she doesn't have a space to house it or show it or share it with the public. So that's how the idea began. And what I had to do there as the chief curator was that I had to work a way where the exhibition becomes a way to really show some part of the permanent collection. But I also wanted it not to just be dedicated to the permanent collection. So to open it up, to have many more other works come to us, loan works come to us, uh, exhibitions travel, things like that. This can, I think in a way it has been good to not have a museum building. Uh, the initial years became very interesting to think about different ways of, you know, working with a museum a collection. How do you do this? Yes. Yeah. Just to build on that, um, I'm a school docent here, so I work with school children and work with Margaret. Mm -hmm. who is a tailor yeah. and we have used this work when we've actually given tours mm -hmm. uh, we've only done them online or on Zoom yeah. and I was hearing you talk about how it's such an immersive mm -hmm. experience so I was in, in also in terms of this expansion of museums I was just thinking as curators where you want to bring these kinds of works to the public or even to young people who I work with you get taught to maybe putting these in public schools or in universities mm -hmm. and having them available for people to experience them rather than sometimes there may be a reluctance to come to the museum. And you come to the museum, you take 
you walk for a piece of a, an art for like three minutes and you're gone. So really to be able to experience this. And to this, we did also an exercise with another, mm -hmm. those we did what was called slow looking. We just sat for 10 minutes in front of the seat. There's a lot of value to that. So as curators, yes. would you to consider putting that in a place where more people can actually experience it? Children can walk around. I'm so people. glad you brought up this because I would have missed talking about it. You know, the Nadal family who have um, are building this museum are, are big in philanthropy for education. They open schools, they open colleges all over India. And recently what I'm doing is I'm working on make putting installations of art in universities and schools. And uh, believe me, one of the project is also a Jai Shri uh, project in the school. So I have to, when I go back, I have to go and survey some of these spaces to actually create that space where a work can be installed for six months, five months, and then and work on it. And this idea also came from the fact that the family, when we have board meetings and discussions, the idea is we do not want to store art. You have the benefit of, you have a collection. It's, it's okay to have exhibitions in museums and all of that, but why not do this at the level, at the grassroots level? How do we work? I mean, you don't want, want children to just see these works in books. Mm -hmm. The experiential factor is so important. Now, Jayshree's work is so much about experiencing it. If I just show you an image, it doesn't do any justice. I would never show these slides because I know when you see the work, it's something else. So you want to sensitize children, then you will have to work out programs of similar kinds. Well, I remember when my child was seven years old when I came to the Bay Area, and I was lucky. I used to go to the school where she was going in Solano, Cornell School. And one day she comes home with, this teacher was amazing who was there. She comes home with a touch book. And the teacher had told them to go and collect whatever things they can. And the idea of touching textures and surfaces. I have never forgotten that even now, when I talk to students, I talk about how important it is to sensitize children, because we are forgetting this whole idea of, you know, what textures mean in our life, what material means, what do you touch, why do you touch and what is the sensation, what things in these, these are experiences. We may say that let us sanitize the vegetables and put them in a plastic, <laughs> uh, a plastic bag. You can't smell the vegetables or fruits. You can't touch them. You don't get a sense of weight or volume. You don't understand so many things are lost in doing something like that. Okay? And our children don't want to touch the earth anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, it's dirty. Oh, is this, is this is, and believe me, these are all things that we need to think about. It's not just about the work that is there. When I watch Jeshi working, I understand the hand has felt every little thing. And it is from here that emotion has been transferred on to the material and to the work. That is such a huge learning there in terms of. So it's not just about aesthetically what is in your work. It's also what goes through you when you process it. And that is where the programs of education, you're so right about it. It's, it's a very huge area of work. And believe me, if I was not in the museum and not a curator, I had no ethnic responsibility, I would be doing that. <laughs> I love to do that. I've been a teacher all my life. And I've, I've stopped teaching now. But I, I think that this is this is extremely important. Our yes. museum is really good that we have people like Margaret and mm -hmm. Deb and Ray. <laughs> And so we do appreciate the museum giving us that. There's one more small question. Yes. I know I'm always talking too much, but <laughs> people are blocking me. <laughs> you know, when you're talking about uh, about using all these different things, they're all things that all are passing away. Talking about grief, and to me, there's also a sense of spirituality in the world, which you know maybe we haven't talked about, but it, I think it underlies a lot of what she's doing. Yes. And so when you're talking about that. On the practical consideration is, do you conserve this work? How do you conserve it? Do you want to conserve it? Because maybe it has its natural life and it talks about what we Such a good question. And uh, a lot of such works 
Kiran Nagar, the enterprising collector, has collected, which are a conservative nightmare, of course. And, and yet, we do want to collect such books. You know? And artists are very cool about it. Ruta Jayashree, she'll say, nothing, something will fall off. It has to fall off, it will fall off. Okay. <laughs> so it is vulnerable. Okay. Even a work of art is vulnerable. You know, you are thinking about the lifespan of an artist. Uh, an artwork, all those are considerations, life expectancy of anything, even a shoe you buy, okay? But the thing is that uh, you want to respect the fact that there are artists who would allow their work to age, also allow their work to decay if possible. It's not something that they want. And I'm just going to quote another artist who I, who I really worked a lot with, Vincent Polari, really another guy in another space, maybe. But he, when I visited his studio at the, there was a work, he was working on some uh, tree branches which he had curated and uh, was uh, working on it and the work was lying in the studio and it was full of cobwebs. And I asked him, so because I was to write this piece on his work and his visit to the studio, so I asked him, and he said, isn't this very natural? Let them be, what is the problem? <laughs> okay, so what is the problem? What's your problem? <laughs> I'm just asking you for films of the work. Hey, well, no, it's reminded. It's there. It's natural that there any, I mean, material do have their afterlives in very different ways. You know, and uh, you as a curator start learning many other things because you now deal not with just materials which are supposed to be art materials or aesthetic materials. Artists are using all anti aesthetic in fact, I have not stressed on Jayashree's drawings, but if I had, she has used eggshell, powdered eggshell, which she powders the cell. She breaks an egg every morning, she keeps the shells, <laughs> she powders them, because in her work, everything's organic, there's nothing else. So, and then she's sprinkling those eggshell uh, on it, and they have a sheen and a shine, and uh, and I, she's, I told her, what about... Will something happen to it? I don't know. It may happen. It may not happen. <laughs> it's a thing that you have to. But but uh, they are trying these things, and sometimes these things age better than many other things. We know that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Jennifer. If I may, I'd like to ask two questions. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, so one practical regarding Jayashree. Um, my understanding is so at least she does both of her work with the yes on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So does she sometimes put the work up and then look and say, well, I need to put something here. Mm -hmm. I need to add a little more color. So she does do that. Vertical scores, yes, vertical she does this. And so the other question is for you as a curator. So um, I'm sure you curate only the exhibition for the work, even for the artists you respect and you like the work. But <coughs> artists like Dana Street, I feel you have emotional connection. Versus an artist who think it's great work, but you don't have that emotional connection. So do you curate differently? Oh, that is a I'll let Rubina answer that. But uh, I don't know how you got a sense of this, but uh, this is true. Uh, so, uh, whether it's Jayshri, who I've known more than 20 years now, whether it's Himmat, who I've known for 40 years now, or um, I, I really I've, I have my heart there in terms of uh, how I connect and how I learn from them. I was just talking about him, because he's now turning 90. And I talk to him every 10 days, he calls me or I call him. And I'm not curating reason. I'm not, I'm not planning to curate any show, but he's done some work. And my conversations with him are what? He tells me, I'm turning 90, my body is very weak, but I'm full of ideas and I'm still seeking my sculpture. And you know what? Let me tell you, nine, after 90 years, I feel my eyes have just opened to the world. <laughs> and every time I speak with these artists, they touch me somewhere. You know? And 
I feel there's a learning which I it just I internalize it because I believe that they see the world so differently through their lens and they live that life. At least some of these artists, I can talk about Jayashri, how she lives in how she uh, she's she lives alone all these years. She lives alone. How solitude is working for her is very different from him who also has lived alone all his life. And how, how in solitude, what he has searched and found. And for me, these little things are so deeply philosophical and spiritual at the place level. And that connects them, makes me see their work very differently than I got on the exhibition. So for me, an exhibition is not just sitting with an artist and having making notes and then just putting the work there. It is, it, it is an internalization for so many years. And I'm a slow worker anyways. I cannot work uh, in a hurried way. So I work, take time to really uh, think about things and work. And, and I feel, so someday I just speak with him and he's talking about politics maybe. And he's just saying that I'm so sad about such a rich country like India. People are just spending their time on wasteful things and unnecessary. Unless you just eliminate the unnecessary, they can never get to something so important. So you are, these learnings for me become a way of reflecting on this. And for Jayashri, yes, I do feel that. That she may not articulate her all the time. She's not somebody who's vocal in that sense that she should stand and give your talk. She hides and she runs away from that kind of a situation. But when I'm in her studio, just observing her, and then when she talks something, it just... It hits me. It's amazing what I find out from there. What a discovery comes through that kind of a conversation. So Abby will say, will agree <laughs> that you gain more through informal conversations yeah. than really conversations that happen at the, and that's the same for school, you know, going beyond classroom instruction, as I say, is, the, is that form of learning is very powerful, very, very powerful. The visual retention is so powerful. The narrative stays and gets internalized. And, process in a very different way. And I think that's where I am so in love with my profession or my just what I do. You know, it has, it's an, I just see it as, it's so enriching to be able to know a little bit about your life before you're born. You know, what life is. So, but, yeah. Well, on that, I, I, I cannot think of more beautiful ending uh, with um, with that comment from Rubina. So let's give Rubina another round of applause. Again, I know that she's also going to have another talk on the 17th with Marianne at Palo Alto Art Center. So um, if you can, definitely join that. And um, Rob, would you like to say a few more words um, before no, I end it? Oh, <laughs> Speak to the thing. Thanks everybody for coming. And most of all, thanks for Vina and Reina for taking this long flight to come and join us here today. Yeah, um, and also um, our uh, wonderful colleague, Janet, always not here today. She helped facilitate a lot of behind the scenes work. So uh, even if she's not here, I still want to acknowledge her uh, for all her help. So thank you all very much for coming over. We know it was a short notice and you show up. It's amazing. Thank you thank so you much. Very much.